I would like to welcome our distinguished guest, Professor Piotr Petrovsky. Piotrovsky. Uh, all of us are very excited on the topic of his lecture. But first, I would like to introduce him for a short. Mm, before doing that, I would like to express my gratitude to our partners. These are the Polish Cultural Institute in Sofia, the Institute of Contemporary Arts in Sofia, and the seminar, the visual image of the New Bulgarian University, uh, with the efforts of uh, our friends, the visit of Professor Piotrowski became possible, so thank you very much. Professor Piotrowski is one of the persons which are capable of transcending local context. His last book will be dedicated on the globalizing of Eastern Europe and East European art. So we are waiting this book. But uh, uh, first I would like to enlist the distinguished positions he had in the past and nowadays. He was uh, chair of the Department of History of Arts at the University Adam Mickiewicz in Poznan. After that, he was the director of the National Museum in Warsaw. He used to teach in, at the University of Warsaw, at Humboldt University, uh, at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and in Bard College in New York. Uh, a lot of lecturing all around the world, including also Bulgaria. Uh, it is uh, with the help of the visual Seminar, the seminar of uh, the visual image at the New Bulgarian University. He visited Bulgaria at 2007. So, uh, the list of his achievements is not very short, but uh, of course the major achievements are his books. And I will mention here, I mentioned already one forthcoming book, I, I believe. Is it, or is it ready already? No, no, no it's a uh, um, process, you know, it will be ready maybe 2007. But two, but, uh, two books are uh, mm, fortunately already ready. These are uh, in sh The Shadow of Yalta, Art and Avant-Garde in Eastern Europe, 1945-1989, and Art and Democracy in Post-Communist Europe. You see that uh, uh, even in the title, the arts are put in a general social and political context, and this is the approach of Professor Petrovsky. <coughs> so, uh, um, under his achievements, I would list also uh, his uh, major critical ideas. For me, they are even more important than the book themselves. I will only list these ideas the agorophilia and the critical political role of the arts in the public space, the connection of the arts with the idea of radical democracy, the critical globalization of the radical fight for democracy, and the so-called critical museum. You see, all of them are critical ideas. Professor Petrovsky is a critical thinker. Mm. Recently, uh, he initiated the so-called uh, horizontal comparative history of the arts, which is very interesting. By the way, uh, one can see here certain parallels uh, with efforts of the literary historians of Eastern Europe, which are doing something similar. And uh, reading the title of today's lecture, I was very intrigued, I was even excited because I knew very well how difficult this topic is. The Crossroads Europe Affirmative Critique is something which is certainly very difficult because it should maneuver around many different ideas of Europe and around many different projects of Europe. After the post-colonial critique of uh, Eurocentrism by Edward Said, by the Pesha Kravarti, by Samira Adin, Amin. We can say that uh, the idea of Europe is totally <coughs> that. Because uh, once and forever, for those post-colonial thinkers, 
Europe seems to be irrelevant province already. And uh, we should take this post-colonial critique very seriously. It is really, uh, a lot is at stake in the post-colonial approach. At the same time, here in Europe, we, are, uh, we have an important spiritual inheritance coming from, let's say, the idea of Europe developed lately by Husserl and his pupil Papuchka, where Europe is most Eurocentric than ever. Europe is a certain privileged idea of uh, eternity uh, and endlessness. Mm, it is uh, a new spiritual form of human being, which is transcending geographical places and even historical periods. Next to that is the political and bureaucratic project called European Union, which has nothing to do with the idea of Europe. So, and the affirmative critique of the idea of Europe should maneuver over all, all around these, let's say, traps, difficulties, these great dangers. And uh, I'm very excited to hear how this will be done by Professor Piotr. Between social democracy, conservatism, and neoliberalism, the East Side was suffering the so called state communism. Euphemistic, euphemistically called people's democracy, of course, having nothing to do with democracy at all. And had an entirely different approach to the idea of Europe. Definitely not critical, on the contrary, idealized. Let me just recollect what the director of the Hungarian news agency said in his dramatic appeal in 1956 during the Budapest uprising. We are dying for Europe, he said. Let me also recollect the title of the famous Milan Kundera's essay, The Tragedy of Eastern Europe, where the tragedy means to cut a part of Europe off from the whole continent, understood mostly as an idealized value system. Being blind on the real problems from which West Europeans have been suffered in the course of the Cold War decades, East Europeans created an image of Western Europe as a paradise of freedom, a source of, ensla of en uh, enslavement for us was the East, precisely the Soviet Union, a source of freedom in turn was a mythical West. At the, at the same time, we did not see how the idea of Europe was a complex issue for outsiders, that is, non-Europeans. This complex issue come, came to us, I believe, in the, latest turning, in the latest turn of the old continent, that is, in 1989. Chapter 1, there will be five chapters. Chapter 1, 1989. What happened in, 1990, in 1989? In Beijing, in February, the exhibition China Avant-Garde was opened and almost immediately closed by the authority, authorities. Opened again and finally closed. Altogether, it was something like <coughs> two weeks. It looked like the end of communism in China, but unfortunately it was not. This exhibition, which can be seen as the climax of political and cultural changes, had been gradually de developed since 1978, preceded the massacre on the Tiananmen Square in June the same year. Along with China Avant-Garde, three other important shows have been opened that year, two in Europe and one in Cuba. First, they organized by Jean-Hubert Martin, Magicien de la Terre, Saint-Pompidou in Paris. Second, uh, curated by Rashid Arain, The Other Stories, Afro-Asian artists in post-war Britain, in Haywood, in Haywood Gallery. That's a good idea. I, I, I would have to say, I have to know that. It's of my own.
my mistake, sorry. Yeah, no problem, I, I, let me do the same. Yeah, I, I was... <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so the second was uh, Rashid Arin, Arin uh, in High Hayward Guy, London. And the third, curated by Gerardo Mosquera, the third edition of Havana by Neo. The latter has also competed, uh, competed, uh, they competed the process, supposed to have completed the process of cultural changes, producing a sort of hope that communism went to its end in Cuba. But it did not, it did not. No. Definitely, all those exhibitions, and much more organized circa the time, uh, followed later by Documenta in Castle, especially Documenta 11, curated by Okui Edwards in 2002. The Global Contemporary Art Awards after 1989, organized in the CKM Museum of Neue Kunst in Karlsruhe, by Hans Belting and Andra Budenzik in 2011, so relatively new, but he dealt with, with uh, 1989. And a lot of biennials, such as in Dakar, Sydney, Moscow, Prague, actually, were two. Istanbul, Poznan, right, the small city, but it's also biennial, the global one. And many others introducing new geography, or extended art geography, including a large number of artists from the former Third War, now called the Global South. What I want to say is that a series of exhibitions organized in Europe and behind mark not only a new global perspective in the arts, but also change a position of Europe itself. And such a change was not one-dimensional. Of course, a global thinking did not appear only that time, the Cold War, as a result of World War II, and accompanying with decolonization in Asia and Africa was global in its character, indeed. But at the same time, it was inscribed in the bipolar political and ideological framework. After 1989, however, this ideological bipolar framework disappeared, and the global landscape has changed fundamentally in terms of economy, politics and culture, also in terms of new wars. New wars, definitely not called. In Eastern Europe, no important and significant exhibition has been opened that year, talking about 1989. Instead, communist system collapsed. There is something too, right? Signified by more or less free parliamentary election in Poland exactly, exactly on the same day when Tiananmen Square massacre took place in China. That is June 4, 1989. A few months later, the Berlin Wall fell down, and the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia took place, and rather a bloody revolution in Romania overthrew the local regime. Two years later, the Soviet Union collapsed too, concluding the communist system in Europe would does not necessarily mean, unfortunately, the triumph of democracy in the entire post-Soviet bloc. Just to mention what has happened and still happens in Belarus, Belarus and Russia itself. The large exhibition which somehow followed political changes in Eastern Europe was Europa, Europa, curated by Richard Stanislavski in well, 1994, followed by two smaller but significant shows actually Beyond Belief in Chicago and After the Wall in Stockholm. Those three exhibitions differ to each other by their first approach to the idea of the unity of European culture by showing East European art in the 20th century, but before and after the Alta Agreement, the second showed a sort of a landscape of contemporary art at that time, trying to submit a diagnosis about the state of affairs in just liberated countries and to open a perspective for the future. The third was a retrospective in terms of what has already been done 
in the region since 1989, up to the end of the decade. Many things, however, has happened and still has been happening since 1989, both in Europe and around the world. Global terrorism, wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, violation of, hum of the human rights not only in Guantanamo, but also in case to the Poland, where was the, uh, the CIA prison uh, in, uh, in Poland. So, you know, this is, a very, this is a shame for Polish government and Polish state that they kept this hidden uh, CIA, CIA prison. Killing the suspects without judging them, as in the case of Osama bin Laden. Global exploitation, unsuccessful, unfortunately, Arab Spring, financial crisis and many others. <coughs> <coughs> Let's focus on Europe now, since Europe is the topic of today's talk. There was a war in former Yugoslavia, and there is a war in Ukraine. War is always disastrous, disastrous. But I'm not going to talk on the casualties, rather on a crisis of democracy that we are facing in a consequence of that war. European strategy, at least to Russia, responsible for war in Ukraine, was done along with the following premises. If we, that is the democratic West, make business with Russia, it will be the best way to incorporate Russia to the free, to the free world and to subordinate it to Europe and Western democracy. It looks like, however, the results are quite the opposite. Making big business with Russia, this country subordinated us and caused a crisis in the West. This is not we, the people, who make the politics. There are big companies enterprises, corporations, and state administrations that are making politics in order to fulfill expectations of corporations rather than the people. In one word, after 25 years after 1989, we see we are not safe and cannot control the situation. This is a point of departure of, today, of my today talk. More precisely, a question I'd like to develop here is, what kind of critique can we make in order to defend some European ideas, such as democracy and human rights? Let me also ask what kind of a vision of the future, if any, can derive from the critique of the post-1989 crisis? It's inspired by an idea of affirmative Affirmative Humanities, proposed by a Polish scholar, Ewa Domańska, who in turn is inspired by Rossi Braidotti, Rossi Braidotti's concept of the ethics of affirmation and or affirmative politics, and tries to combine a critical tradition with an affirmative approach. The affirmative in this context means not a negative and fearful approach to the reality and history, neither a naive, positive way of thinking, but rather thinking in terms of potentiality, of possible changes. There is not only a rejection of the status quo, not trauma and trauma and oppression, but a hope for solidarity in the Maiska and Braidotti's case means also not only human solidarity, it's only solidarity, but I'm not going to touch this post-human condition as they did. My concept, however, does not go to create a sort of a new paradigm of the humanities understood in the context of post-humanism and post-anthropocentric discourse as the Maiska and Braidotti did. It is not only less ambitious than their project, but also has different goals. It does, not, it does not propose a model of future studies, rather a prospect of a possible basis for a utopia, actually a global utopia, 
it is not only a critique, uh, a crit uh, not only a critique is this is the issue, a sort of negative issue, but also a positive value system that can show a positive approach to the future. Now chapter three, gender check versus global feminisms and affirmative critique. Choosing gender, a specific material basis of her analysis, Boyana Page, a curator of Gender Check, opened an enormous way to discuss the European issue. What did really matter was to reject not only the mythical European cultural unity, as for example the above mentioned Europa, Europa expressed very clearly, but also, and what is even more important here, a totalitarian paradigm or traumatic model as an approach to feminist or feminist-like art in Eastern Europe. So she rejected this. It helped her and her contributors to uh, untie a relationship between gender oppression and a communist dictatorship usually so typically fasten and at the same time to open it for a broader European context. Why recording? Actually after Edith Anders. Michel Foucault, already classical theory of power, and his argument that the Soviet model does not differ substantially from the West, from the Western one. Bojana Page was able to show two aspects of East European gender at the same time. How it was different, on the one hand, and how it was similar to the Western one. Communist system worked historically on much deeper gender structure, such as, for example, religion, especially Catholicism, which differed much the strategies of power in Poland on the one hand, and Czechoslovakia on the other. Although both of them were communist countries, such as social practice towards the body, different in Albania on the one hand, and the GDR with its traditional German popularity of nudism, etc. So we can, we can make a list of those, of those things which made the situation quite different in different countries. Discussing, discussing that whole complex issue on the critical way, it is showing its social and historical framework. We could, we could compare it to the West. The gender issue was definitely not homogeneous at all, neither in the East <coughs> nor in the West. The latter was definitely not free in comparison to the East. It's simply dependent on the same historical and social references than those in the East. Sweden obviously was not Italy, as well as Greece was not France, etc. If we take into account some particular women's rights, as abortion, for example, we will see we will see that we will see that some European countries, some East European countries, were quite more progressive, especially after Stalinism, than the so-called Western democracies. For example, in Italy, Italy, at least up to the 1970s. East European art was the avant-garde of a process of social changes. Its role was particularly important that uh, political. It, 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 its role was particularly important that political opposition, which in turn emerged to different extent in Eastern Europe, was extremely conservative in terms of gender here, and frankly speaking, reproduced traditional gender models. <coughs> I was involved in the opposition, and I remember that uh, we did not care so much about the gender issue. And uh, frankly speaking, if we see right now the situation 
retrospectively, we see how you know the gender issue was reproduced by by uh, by uh, the opposition, reproduced uh, the, the official, let's say, structure when women were oppressed. The problem with art, however, is that while referring to women's question, either on the essentialist or constructivist way, usually did not do that in feminist discourse, apart from some few exceptions, such as Sina Ivekovic, for example, in Croatia. Such artists as Jeta Bratescu, Natalia Laglaovic, Jana Zelipska, might be called by Zora Rusinova, this is the Slovakian art critic, latent feminism. Lack of theoretical feminist background in most artists like these was a mirrored problem of lacking of historical knowledge about West European women artists about the East. As Bojana Page recorrects the famous meeting organized in Belgrade Students Cultural Center in 1978 under the title Comrade Woman, the Woman's Question a New Approach. That was the title of this this is paradigmatic. It was a paradigmatic, frankly speaking, conference. Those two camps, Western and Eastern, is the Western fellow women artists and the Eastern counterparts could not fully communicate since the Western part did not believe that the meeting was independent, not supported by the authorities. The Eastern part, in turn, did not want to define itself in Marxist ideology as it was recognized as the official discourse of power rather than critical. Nevertheless, the confrontations show the real affirmative critique approach to the issue, since they both did understand the woman's questions lying be behind the political and ideological division of the continent, brought by the slogan, proletarians of all countries, who washes your socks, <coughs> formulated at the same time a prospect of equality and emancipation. Then I think I skip the second, uh, this one, the global feminist, uh, a uh, um, short analysis in order not to kill you, and uh, because uh, you know it's better to 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 cut the talk uh, because it's, it's at the beginning. And uh, it, or at least in the middle and not at the end, because the end it comes the conclusion. So you know you, you will you will lose the conclusion. We lose the conclusion. So anyway, let's leave this. You know, I comparing those two exhibitions, saying that the gender check organized by Bojana Page was much more broader, and uh, and uh, touched much deeper problems than the global feminism Brooklyn uh, um, actually um, uh, before. So let me pick up uh, the problem, uh, I mean, the slogan, what Bojana Page used. Let me repeat, proletarians of all countries, who washes your socks? Which was at the same time the title of her introductory essay. A reference to Marx is, of course, ironical, since Marxism was the official ideology of Eastern, of Eastern Europe not its critique, but also since it was, at least uh, originally and uh, definitely in the real existence socialist practice, practice sexist. If we remember that according to the godfathers of Marxism, like Engels, for example, that was class society, private property, and economical exploitation responsible for women, women dis discrimination, not sexism as such. The class struggle does not refer to those who wash workers' socks. However, on the other hand, there is also a subtitle of Page's essay, very important for the exhibition, Equality, Dominance and Differences in East European Art. Looking at the art pieces shown at the exhibition, and you might, I mean, at least, 
majority of you might be familiar with this. Looking at the art pieces shown at the exhibition and reading through the text published in the catalog, one cannot doubt that what was behind was a desire for gender equality, not only critique, but also desire for gender equality, understood as human rights and artistic freedom, understood on the same basis. The exhibition definitely stood for gender equality, and that was its general affirmative, if you like, message. That was not the case in this American one. I'm sure that analyzing sources of dominance referring to the value system based on freedom and equality on the way of affirmative critique that is creating a vision of the future rather than stressing the mechanism of oppression only. Oyana Page made an uh, interesting guidepost for not only European project. <coughs> Chapter 4. Affirmative, affirmative critique and the critique and, and crisis. Now, a more complex example that is the desire for freedom are in Europe since 1945, created by Monika Flacke in the Deutsches Historisches Museum in Berlin in 2012. The exhibition was traveling, it was in Milano. Uh, Tallinn, Estonia, and also Krakow, maybe still is, or will be, I don't know. <coughs> it referred, this exhibition, it referred both to the period of the Cold War division, that is before 89, as well as to the art made after this date, at the same time. Although it was uh, organized in Berlin, former divided city, situated exactly on the former Cold War frontier, the exhibition did not refer to the former European geopolitical division, rather to its common background. That is, the Enlightenment, this is very important right now, the Enlightenment tradition, or the dialectics of the Enlightenment, understood along with Reinhard Koselek's premises drawn from his famous book, Critique and Crisis. That was his PhD dissertation, actually. More precisely, I would like to analyze this exhibition in the context of the so-called European idea. Since Europe, since Europe was precisely in its center, I'm a couple of quite, I'm a, I'm a, I'm of course quite aware that Europe has different faces as Alexander Kiesef said, you know, at the beginning. And different foundations, negative and positive, colonialism, oppression, racism, imperialism, exploitation, hegemony, even extermination are on the negative side. Taking into account this side of a critique of Eurocentrism made by post-colonial scholars, and not only, is uh, quite understandable, since the European idea was strongly corrupted. Uh, there is, however, the other side of Europe, and its intellectual, cultural, and political tradition Definitely affirmative. Equality, solidarity, freedom, democracy, human rights, as I stress so much, human rights, emancipation, all those values connected with the Enlightenment tradition. Workers' uprising and the ethos of intelligentsia. Now let me raise the question how the desire for freedom, this exhibition, fulfill this affirmative idea, if any. It is of course striking that the, that the exhibition combined two crucial words, desire and freedom. 
not necessary critique and crisis, as, as its title has been previously planned after Reinhard Kosalek's famous book. But it does not mean that the show left Kosalek's theory and his approach to dialectical relation between critique and crisis. Reinhard, Reinhard Kosalek himself, at the beginning of his famous book, referred to the Cold War division, arguing that both sides of the conflict, West and East, are rooted in the Enlightenment tradition. What means for him that both sides have been facing more or less similar structural problems. That is, unfulfilled utopia or keeping a sort of a gap between politics understood as the public activities, reduce it to solving technical problems on the one hand, and moral questions which are suppressed from the public to the to the, to the private sphere. This, 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 this is the dialectics what uh, Kosselek reconstructed. <coughs> this constant gap recognized by Kosselek as the Enlightenment tradition causes a constant crisis not only in bourgeois Western society but also those governed by Eastern red bourgeoisie. The exhibition itself broke the Cold War division and went beyond the Iron Curtain. As Horst Brennekamp pointed out, beyond different strategies to control societies, repressive surveillance and playful self-organization, censorship and manipulation, and went to a deeper European condition than just everyday politics. In its structure, the exhibition made a sort of circle or cycle starting from the court of, of reason as a collapse of enlightenment idea and ending with the words in our heads as a pessimist diagnosis of today's situation accord, according to which the, the enlightenment idea understood as a utopia, can be kept in our heads only, that is, in private sphere only. It is, of course, reproduced Kosalek's, I mean, the, the, the structure of the exhibition, <coughs> Kosalek's dialectics. Although there were 12, there were 12 sections, I'm not going to call them, 12 sections of so the reason of the court of reason was the beginning, there were a couple of others, and the, the uh, world in our hearts was uh, finished, so there was a sort of cycle, like 12 hours around the clock, like 12 months, something like this, so there was the, there was the idea of, uh, of, uh, of um, uh, the organizers, curator of this exhibition. Let me just... Uh, it's worth to mention that the desire for freedom started with Jan Hamilton Finlay's Je vu salut Mara, so on the left, from 1989. So that was the beginning of the exhibition. And, uh, and uh, using three color symbol of the French Revolution, which was one of the crucial artwork in the first section, it was the beginning, as I said. First section, let me repeat, it was the, the chord of reason. It ended with pieces showing a sort of inaccessibility to the words in our heads, such as Eric Bulatov's self-portrait not entry, Niet Choda, Niet Choda, 1973. I mean, there was not the last exhibition, at least not in the Berlin installation. It was a, a bit crazy, the last. There was a, a uh, sort of flag of uh, of. Germany, which was made by by uh, people who used to work on the uh, color background, but this is a different story. And it was not in Milano, for example. So the, 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 the particular designer decided, but the whole structure was the same. To see this process, 
in the framework of Cossanex dialectics is a failure of a utopia which in spite of being public still remains in our hands, that is, in private sphere, it would be hardly to recognize this project in terms of affirmative critique. Neither Kosalek nor the exhibition is optimistic. It shows a deep critical way, it shows in a deep, deep critical way and constant crisis of the post-enlightenment societies, impossibility to incorporate a moral issue to the public sphere to fulfill a utopia. It does not show any prospect for the future. Maybe there's no future. This, of course, possible. However, the whole post-enlightenment process is a desire, very often dramatic, and almost always against the power, whether it might be the Western or Eastern one. Desire for fulfillment, a hope raised by the declaration of the rights of the rights of man and citizen from 1789, uh, which has been confirmed as the Universal Declaration, not only European, in 1948 by the United Nations. This desire comes to us in spite, in spite of the dark side of history, in spite of a deep discredited universalist modernism by colonialism, in spite of its accusation of racism, colonial practices, hegemony, and imperialism. I would argue, however, for new universalism, let's say post-traumatic, global universalism, although I'm aware that it sounds like a blasphemy in the world dominated by post-colonial critique. But blasphemy, let me add, has its rights to exist in democracy. This conclusion, of course, is different than that one suggested by Kosalek in 1954. That's what this book comes from. Let me repeat, according to the latter, a crisis is permanent, according to Kosele, is permanent since moral questions such as uh, freedom are private and suppressed from the public. Thus, I would rather argue for solving Kosele's critical ap aporia and for fulfillment the enlightenment utopia in the way of affirmative critique whether it is realistic or not. This is another question. Let's realize, just to point out its historical context, that now we are 60 years after the date when Kosalek wrote this book. And he did it just nine years, nine years only after Nazism. And even two years before Khrushchev Khrushchev thought th th in the USSR. So the situation in 1954 was completely different, psychological. <coughs> not, not political, of course, but psychological. It was different. There was the Cold War, you know, and so, and so on, you know. Gulag. I believe that Kasarek could help us, but not necessarily on the ground of the book already mentioned, Critique and Crisis. But the newer essay entitled Space of Experience and Horizon of Expectation, published in his book <coughs> Futures, Futures Past, originally German title was Vorgangene Zukunft zu Semantik Geschichte Zeiten. It was published in 1979. So I'm just going to this book right now. Actually, to one essay of this book. The general Kosalex idea is that in traditional societies, in traditional societies, horizon of expectation is determined by space of experience. However, in modern society, societies is not. 
because of progress and other characteristic of new times in Germany's neue Zeit, there is a gap between an expression of the past and what we expect from the future. Not what has happened determines what we should expect anymore. On the contrary, we what we expect should shape our experience. So this is the completely different approach as used to be in the traditional society, according to Kosovo. This is especially the revolution which changed this order. Of course, Kasarek analyzed these mechanisms on the example of French Revolution. For him, a relation between space of, expect space of experience and horizon of expectation is a critical concept which explains how history works. This is at the same time, a real affirmative critique. He used it in a retrospective way. Shall we use it in a crit in a, a shall we use it? Shall we use such a critique on the prospective way? I hope yes. Maybe the open question, however, is whether we are facing a sort of revolution at the moment or not. I'm not sure that we can answer this question now. What we can do instead is to expect changes, to realize that our horizon of expectation can produce a new gap between what is happening right now and what should happen in the future. This is not a speculative argument. Let me just remind what Immanuel Wallenstein, or Wallenstein if you like, suggests talking on a utopistics. Generally speaking, the latter means, the uh, utopistics, uh, means the analysis of social, political, economic situation in order, in order to create the most possible processes that must take place in the future. He is arguing thus, that now, uh, Wallerstein, that now we are at the, at the turning point of the world economy, or the world economy, facing the end of capitalism and emerging something new, according to him. How it would like. What it could be, there's of course not definite answers for that. Somehow it depends on us. This is the message what Wallenstein made. It depends on us, he suggests. It means that not only we can expect the new system as better in terms of respecting human rights, for example, or the more democratic, economically fair. Now chapter five, the last, and the, the title of this chapter is the quotation. I'm not a political artist. I'm a politician who works in the public sphere. This is Krzysztof Wodiczko. <laughs> Let me quote Krzysztof Wodiczko who, at the end of his text, not this one, but the other text, the book actually, which was at the same time a project of the 9-11 monument to make New York, New York the city of refugee, of refuge. And he said, at the end, I mean, to change New York into the city of refugees was his concept as the monument. So not to build a sort of monument, neither you know, um, what is his uh, name, the uh, Lebeskind, you know, uh, building or something like this, no. The monument should be to change the city. This is, the, this is from the Bible. I mean, the city of refugee comes from the Bible. The open city for all refugees. Vodichko pro Vodichko's project is somehow very simple. <coughs> he and Jaroslav Kozakiewicz, an architect who cooperates with him, suggests to make a tunnel across and under the square from the Marshall Monument to the top. This, this should be... This is a pointer. Like this one. Space supposed to serve as educational room to condemn war culture 
and propagate anti-war culture. The institute should work as a sort of the educational peace institute, teaching people about historical and present wars, or against these wars, indeed. Not only in Poland, where fortunately there is, not, there is no war at the moment, but also elsewhere. Wodichka's project looks like as the idea in the artist has. Even if he is very successful in case of realizing other projects concerning war, including war veterans ones. However, it is not necessary, it must be a private idea in terms of Kosselex, critique and crisis. If we realize that, that the war is the real challenge at the moment, as it's my opinion, it is. Uh, we have to create any kind of the world institute for the abolition of wars. Not necessarily something like that one proposed by Bodichko. Any kind of any kind of intellectual, scholarly, artistic and civic projects that could serve in achieving this goal, understood as the horizon of expectation along with along with we can shape our experience. Thank you very much.